everybody. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to everyone here in this place. It's great to have you here. If you're online, welcome to you as well. You know, Psalm 133 says how good and pleasing it is when uh, we dwell together in unity. And so, uh, like the disciples in Acts, why don't we, uh, if with one heart and one mind, worship our God this morning? Why don't we stand up? Sing up from the ashes. Do I got 
Let's just pray. Close our eyes. Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you that you are here in our midst right now. Jesus, we lift our eyes to you this morning. We thank you for everything that you have done. For we couldn't do it, Father. And you did everything that we needed. So God, we thank you this morning for that. In Jesus' name. in grace.
good is it to worship God this morning, is it, church? To be in his house with one heart, with one voice, to glorify the name of Jesus. I was just reminded of Paul's words in Ephesians 4 as we were singing this morning with that theme. That there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all and who is over all and through all and in all. How good is that? We are one people. Lord, we just want to worship you as one people this morning, joined by one spirit to glorify the name, the great name of Jesus this morning. And oh, Lord, how good it is to be in your presence, Lord, gathered together this morning with one heart. We thank you for those who are watching online too, Lord. May they know that they're connected through your spirit this morning. And we just worship you, Lord, in this place. We thank you for the hope that we share, the wonderful future that we have in Christ. And so we worship you, Lord, as one people this morning. It's so good to be together, Lord. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are united as one this morning, so it's good. Why don't you take a moment to welcome each other in a COVID safe way, of course, uh, with people around you. Have a wave or an elbow tap, but that would be great this morning. Good morning, everyone. Please take a seat. Good morning online. It's great that you're able to um, come and see us gathered here. I'll just share a few announcements with you. On Friday night, we had our first Grove So Kids social. It was so much fun. I just have to say, we haven't been able to have kids gathered um, on a Sunday morning, and um, it's been really hard. But Friday night was just so lovely. The kids were all gathered, and we just had such a great time. So we're really, really blessed that we're able to have those fortnightly um, Grove Kids socials. The next one, kids, next week is the family service. The next one after that is a chalk chase. And we're going to have lots of fun. The good old chalk chases are always fun. Uh, Grove Youth News on Friday night, they had their Junior Youth Connect. And this afternoon, they have Senior Youth Connect. And then on Friday night, they have an outdoor movies night. Hopefully, rain permitting, they're going to have outdoor movies. And that'll um, be lots of fun as well. And we're continuing that fortnightly theme of doing connect groups or family services and fortnightly socials with our kids and our youth until we get the building and then it's going to be so exciting. It'll be so much fun having our own kids and youth area that we can just bless these kids and disciple these kids each week, which will be wonderful. Next Saturday afternoon is Good Company, so which is coming back, which is really exciting to see. Uh, so Good Company will be next Saturday afternoon, a BYO uh, barbecue at Highbury Park in um, Upper Kedron. So that's a fantastic opportunity. And then I did see in the newsletter that on the first week of November, there's a men's dinner happening. So um, Book that in. If you're getting, if you don't get the church newsletter, um, send us a, a email at hello at thegrove.org.au or speak to Sandy or Roz. Get on that mailing list because it's really excited. Why we're in this season of scattered church where we've, we've got online people and we've got people here. These are really beautiful opportunities to connect with others. So um, make sure you get to those events and they're really great, fun things. Marty, you've got some news as well. Well, thanks. Thank you so much, Lee. It is actually great that there's a bit more gathering going on now, and I pray that people are really encouraged and blessed by that. How good is it to be in air-conditioned comfort this morning, church? Did you notice that? On a, <laughs> a normally pretty muggy day after the rain, here we are very blessed. We're not used to that as a church at all. Next year, we'll have a church building which will be air-conditioned, so that's a real blessing. But uh, So if you're at home this morning and you haven't come to a gathered service yet, you are missing out on a beautiful environment here, but we are glad you are here and we love you and, and glad you tuned in. 
this morning. Um, just a couple of announcements I want to make today. Um, first, thank you for those who have joined in for our 12 weeks of prayer. Um, prayer is where it is at. I've always believed that, and I really believe it is a season, a call from God to pray as a church at the moment. Um, it was a mark of the early church. Um, Nathan mentioned the early church this morning who are of one heart and one mind, and uh, they constantly gathered together and joined together in prayer. Corporate prayer, praying with others, is incredibly powerful. And so that's why we're having 12 weeks of praying together uh, through this season. Um, we have a, uh, this is our fourth week, and every week in our newsletter, we have a prayer guide. I'd love you to click on that, download that, because that is a prayer devotion. It gives some prayer notes about what we're praying about the week, and there's a family's devotion, prayer devotion, and we're making up games. This week, you're going to need a magnifying glass for the theme, which is Think Big, Start Small, um, coming out of Dave's sermon that he's going to bring in a moment, but um, get into that and play those games, because I'm having as much fun making them up, and I hope people are playing them, so uh, get into those kids and uh, enjoy this prayer devotion and this prayer season. Uh, that would be great. And we have a statewide prayer meeting tomorrow night for QB. Um, and uh, we had one a um, couple of months ago, and it was incredibly powerful, I found, and just praying with people across the state. So that's a Zoom prayer meeting, and you can find the link in your email newsletter and be part of praying with churches across our movement uh, tomorrow night. It would be great, 7.30. Um, just some things on the building. It's just exciting to see the stage and the um, back walls and rooms have been built now. <laughs> it's coming together. Um, that'll all be painted this week. As an old painter, it makes me feel like getting out the brush and the roller. I want to be part of it. But um, it's so good to see it coming together and all that God is doing there. Um, we need to fill that space with 420 chairs, though. And we've bought 90 so far, which is great. Fantastic. Thank you to all those who are buying chairs. They keep flowing in. But uh, they there's more white than red there at the moment on that. We keep adding and colouring in those chairs as more chairs come in. So if you want to be part of this appeal and buy a chair for someone you would love to see come into that church and be blessed, that's the idea behind this chair appeal. Get on, $100 a chair, go to Call to Build and tag your gift chairs. And uh, let's keep seeing that, that go up. Um, also, I just want to mention um, each week that we do want to keep our focus church on their weekly budget. As it gets closer and closer to completion, we're going to be drawing the four full $4 million of our loan uh, by the end of December. And that's why we set a budget goal of $10,000 a week, and we are a significant shortfall. So please be praying about how God is leading you uh, to contribute and be part of that as we press on towards this goal that God has given us. We can't wait to open those doors. Well, let's continue uh, in our service, and I'm just going to pray as we continue on this morning. So, Ben, come back up. That'd be great. Lord, we just want to thank you so much, God, just to uh, be together this morning. We thank you for the opportunities we've had, Lord, to just gather again in different ways, Lord. And we thank you just for the different groups that are meeting. Lord, kids gathering together. Praise God. It's such an incredible future for the next generation in our community. And Lord, uh, Father, we just want to pray that you just bless our kids and bless our teenagers, Lord. And may they all come to know and love you, Lord, from a young age, Lord. They, of all the things we can pass on to the next generation, it's a, a relationship with you is so far above anything else, Lord. And we thank you that we have a church family and a um, people who have heard the call to minister to children in this place. And we just want to pray that you would just continue to ready us and shape us for a, for a great impact next year and this year into the next generation, we pray. Lord, we thank you, uh, Father, for what you're doing up on that building site, God. It's exciting to see that building going up. But, Lord, a building is just a building without your spirit and without the, the church, which is the body of Christ. And so we thank you that you're unifying a people and you've given us a place. And, Lord, we're just available for you to be building new things in our lives and getting us ready for all the ministry you want to do in and through us as a church, Lord. And we thank you for this season of prayer. Is there anything more important to do in these next couple of months, Lord, before we open those doors? No, there isn't, Lord, because prayer unifies us like nothing else, Lord. And, and it also is our expression, Lord, of humility that, that it's you who does the work, Lord. And it's us who depends on you. 
And so we're uniting our hearts together. And I just pray that many, many from around our state, even from our Grove Church, tomorrow night would zoom in for that prayer meeting, Lord. And that, God, we really long to see a movement in Queensland beyond anything we have seen before, Lord. Oh, Father, could this be the year, the year of a pandemic when it's the year of a powerful movement of your spirit starting to really just move through churches and through our state, we pray. So, Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. We, we want to pray for your blessing on the, on the finances in this church that you continue to provide all that we need for the building up there, Lord. Uh, we pray that the rain wouldn't soak that ground too much on that hill that, that, so we can continue on track with the car parking. And we pray for the sewer line connection, Lord, and some of the difficulties we always face there, Lord. We just want to pray you would smooth the way, provide open doors that need to be open there. Oh, God, we commit it all to you, Jesus. Lord, we just want to thank you for those in our body who are hurting at the moment. And we just thank you because you love them so much. And we continue to pray for Pete and Viv, Lord, in this journey in their lives. And God, just wrap your arms around them, Lord. May they just sense your presence even this very day, God. Um, For others here, many others, Lord, in fact, that are carrying deep and heavy burdens, Lord difficulties in friends and families and we just want to pray that you do your healing work among us lord we pray so we continue in our service now in your wonderful name amen amen Um, that's great we're going to sing a song and uh we don't take up a physical offering but after church you can drop your offering into that um letterbox on the way out if you would like to do that but let's stand and sing thank you
God, we thank you there's a place for us in your in our Father's house, Lord, that we can belong here through the precious blood of Jesus shed for us to be in the family of God and we can become all you want us to be as we listen to your word, as we align our lives to the things you're calling us to. And so, Lord, we just open our hearts to you right now and our minds. We lean in attentive, God, to the things you're going to share to us through your word now as Dave comes to preach now. So we pray and commit this to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's great. Thank you so much. Be seated. Oh, I just want to just real hands up to hats off for the tech guys and the worship guys for blessing us this morning and putting all the work in so we can worship and gather and here online as well. Uh, you guys at home. Um, I just want to introduce you to David Elvery. So come up, um, Dave. And uh, Dave's actually part of the QB movement, used to be a pastor for 16 years, and, uh, but now is uh, p- um, director of pastoral services in the QB and a real blessing to our movement. But first time preaching at the Grove, we have had you here before, which you probably didn't realize, Dave, but we played a video sermon of yours during the lockdown time, which was really good. But Dave's going to come and bring the word today. So we need to give this guy a really big Grove welcome this morning. Why don't we do that? Well, it's fantastic to be here this morning, and um, in some respects, it's like coming home, um, even though I haven't been here in person. You see, I was born and bred on the north side, um, spent 25 years here um, in my childhood, teenage years, but then have left the north side and have been all over the place, Tasmania and Gladstone, and then most recently down on the south side, please forgive me, uh, for 10 years pastoring down at Birkdale and Cannon Hill, Baptist churches, leading teams there. Um, have just taken up a role, as Marty said, at QB, um, with all the restructure that's been happening there, and taking up a role looking after, the, I guess, the, the care of pastors, anything to do with their registration or their, their ordination, their formation, their pastoral care sits under my banner. And so we've moved back up onto the north side, and so it's, it's, it's great to be back in sort of familiar territory and, and to be here this morning because there's a lot of faces I re- recognize here, and it's, it's almost like coming home, um, coming back to where our roots are. So thank you so much for having me, and um, it's going to be great to spend a little bit of time with you. Because of my role, I, I have some information that I'm privy to um, that's really exciting too. And it's, it's good to see there's so many changes happening around the Grove with the new building and such coming up. But about a week ago, I had some interviews um, with Lee and with Alistair about registration of Lee um, to be a Baptist pastor. And Because of my position, I get the the information to know that she's actually been accepted to be a registered Baptist minister. And so that's fantastic. I don't know where she is, but give her a hand because that's that's a great achievement. Um, And so we're really excited about that too. Well, what I wanted to speak about this morning was, I guess, a topic that, and and it's great to to hear you're in, in this um, 12 weeks of prayer and, and praying about what God has for you into the future because I, th- I think what I want to talk about this morning um, really does speak into that, the fact that we come to God um, offering what we can. We're part of this big body, aren't we, of, of members within this church, but also wider than that. Um, and we come and we serve God and sometimes we don't know um, how much of an effect we're having or what impact. Um, so I want to speak into that a little bit this morning, but before I do, I've, I've got a quick quiz for you this morning, and I wonder how many of these you're going to get right. So let's start with an easy one. What is the, the world's biggest mountain? Everest. Yeah, that one's an easy one, isn't it? So Mount Everest, you know that one. Um, what is the world's tallest tree? I heard something over here. The redwood, that's correct. The redwood is the tallest tree, um, Southern Californian redwood. Um, well, next question I want to ask is, who is the world's richest man? Anyone want to volunteer? That they are? It's, it's not Bill Gates. He used to be. He's number two now. Um, who knows who Jeff Bezos is? Amazon. So he's the Amazon founder. So he's now number one in the world. Okay, next question. What's the longest chapter in the Bible? 
Psalm 119, I heard that. That's great. You've got that one. Okay, what's the biggest sea creature in the world? Kids, you probably know this. The blue whale, isn't it? Yep, I don't know how long it is, but it's massive. Blue whale, fantastic. Okay, what country has the largest population? China. Hey, you guys are doing well. I thought about bringing Minties along this morning to reward you, but I thought with the COVID stuff that that might not go down well. So you're just going to have to appreciate that you get them right. Okay, next question. What is the largest land mammal? Yeah, it is the African bull elephant, isn't it? So look, you did really well. Did really well at that quiz, but it's not finished yet. It's not finished yet. Okay, let's see if you can figure out these next set of questions. What is the world's smallest mountain range? Okay, I, I get this one. It's the suit of butters in California. It's about 16 kilometers long, only about 650 meters high. Let's try this one. What's the type of tree that is the shortest? You knew the, the biggest. Not this one. It's the dwarf willow. Only grows to five centimeters tall. Dwarf willow. Okay, let's try this one. Who's the world's poorest man? You knew the richest. Who's the poorest? Hey, no, I can tell you you're not. Okay. It's a guy called Jerome Caville. He's got a debt of 4.9 million euro. 4.9 million euro he owes due to fraudulent trading. So he's probably in a bit of a worse state than mo I think most of us here. Okay, what's the shortest chapter? Oop, let's, I've skipped that. Who's the shortest chapter in the Bible? You know that, I just showed you it. It's Psalm 117, two verses. There it is there. Just comes just before Psalm 119, doesn't it? Shortest, longest. Okay, I'm getting enthusiastic here. What's the smallest fish in the world? The one you catch down at the pier, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> the microfish. <laughs> yeah. No. It, now, if, if there's any biologists here, I apologize right here. It's the Peter Cypress progenica. It's, it's a little fish that lives in the swamps of Sumatra. It's only seven millimeters long. Okay, that's the smallest fish in our world. Okay, you knew what the largest population country was. What's the smallest country population-wise? Hey, I think you've got one. Vatican City, it's only got about 825 people in it. And let's find out whether you can finish off on a bang. What's the, the world's smallest land mammal? The what? It's actually... Oh, where'd it go? I don't know where it... There it is. The bumblebee bat. The bumble... Isn't it cute? That's the world's smallest mammal, land mammal in, in any case. Look, what I bet, and I think you, you, you could probably acknowledge this too, that you knew more of the big questions than the little questions. The questions about what's big, huge impressive rather than the questions about what is small or seemingly insignificant and I'm not surprised by that at all because it's the big things the flashy things it's it, it's those sort of things that catch our eye aren't they not the small not the insignificant not the normal commonplace things that catch our eye see we remember big achievements we remember those things but we give little consideration to the small things that people do or the small things that happen in our world because big is best that's what our motto isn't it big is best that's how we we're, we're raised but i wonder do you ever feel as if what you do what you do for god even is insignificant that it would never make a difference in his world, in your world. I mean, I, I think lots of people think that way, that what they do doesn't make any impact and it's not significant. Um, but I, I don't think that's true. See, sometimes we think that it doesn't matter um, that we're vacuuming the floor. No one's going to notice. That we clean the toilets at church. That we weed um, someone else's garden, or we cook a meal. Those little things we, we don't think matter. 
But whatever we do for Jesus is important. Whatever we do for Jesus is, is valuable. Let me tell you a story about a little boy who, who wasn't seen as very important. His name um, was William Carey. And many of you probably have heard of William Carey before. He lived 250 years ago in a little village um, called, called Paulsbury in Northamptonshire in England. His, his parents were just ordinary people, nothing flash, nothing um, to write home about, and so was little William. In fact, um, when he was seven years of age, William just, um, developed a skin disease, which meant he, he reacted to the sun. Um, and he couldn't go outside and play with the other boys. He had to spend most of his time inside. Um, when he was 14 years of age, um, he got a, a trade as a cobbler. Some of you kids won't know what a cobbler is, but they made and repaired shoes. And, and William learned the trade of how to make shoes and how to, um, how to repair shoes, but, th- but that didn't grab his heart. You see, um, he felt called to be a pastor, but he didn't really have much to offer. He wasn't a good speaker. He wasn't very impressive to look at. He was small and he was sort of baldy and he had a funny looking face and um, all sorts of things like that. He actually even spoke a bit funny. In fact, in his first church, a little place called Olney, they were so unimpressed with William as a pastor that they refused to ordain him. They said, you're not going to make um, pastor. You're not gonna, you haven't got what it takes. William actually often said of himself that his one great strength was that he was a plotter. He may not have had great skills, but he had extraordinary tenacity to just keep going. And so even when things were hard, even when things weren't going well, William never gave up. And so this young preacher persevered, um, and finally he was ordained. Well, William developed a love for the stories of the explorers of the day and the world and the exotic places. And um, with his skills, he made a little globe out of leather. And he began to teach children in Sunday schools and things like that about different countries and about different people and how they needed to know about Jesus Christ. And soon within him rose this passion of wanting to go and tell people about Jesus Christ. He wanted to go overseas and become a missionary. And he tried to encourage as many others to do the same thing. However, again, his efforts weren't appreciated at all. One day when he was addressing um, a meeting, a minister's meeting at Northampton Baptist Association in 1787, um, concerning this, this urge that he had to go on missions, um, there was a man called John Ryland Sr. And he rebuked young William. And he said this. He said, young man, sit down, young man. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without consulting you or me. What a slap down. <laughs> Essentially, Mr. Ryland was saying, William, God doesn't need you. You've got nothing that you can offer God in the work that he wants to do in helping people around our world know about Jesus Christ. Have you ever had a put down like that? Told that what you're doing is not important. Told that um, um, it's not valued. Told that you're not, you're not good enough, that God doesn't appreciate what you're doing, or that maybe it shouldn't be done that way, or, or that you haven't got what it takes, um, that you're too young, that you haven't got enough experience. I mean, the ways we could express this rebuke are just endless, aren't they? But the meaning's the same. What you're doing for God is not acceptable. It's not important. So just give up. It might surprise you that Jesus heard criticism like that. He did. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them this morning to Luke chapter 13. Let's open them to Luke chapter 13, verse 10. And I want to read um, a little bit out of this gospel for us. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. It says, and I'll put it up on the screen if you haven't got your phone or, or anything else there. It says, on a Sabbath... Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had, a, who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and, and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and she praised God. Jesus took the initiative here. He saw a woman who was in need and he helped her. He freed her from a disability that she had had for 18 years. 
um, she was so pleased that, what did she do? She praised God, didn't she? That's pretty good. That's pretty much, we would be so impressed if, if, if that happened here at church this morning, wouldn't we? We'd be incredibly impressed. Do you think that Jesus was doing the right thing in helping this lady who couldn't walk well? Of course he was. But then came the criticism. We read it in verse 14. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. <laughs> Essentially they were saying, people might be impressed by what you're doing, by this miracle, by, by this, this thing, but, but God's not impressed. It doesn't honor or please God when it's done on the Sabbath. So stop it. Don't do it. How, how do you feel when, um, when you do something for God or for, for part of his church only to have another person criticize you, to tell you that it's not good enough, to tell you that it's not appreciated, that, to tell you that it's not done right? It makes you want to give up then and there, doesn't it? Jesus heard that backhanded rebuke and, and he turns to... Um, this, this synagogue ruler, and he says this, he says, The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Now, if you had a donkey, would you leave him tied up for the whole day without food or water? No, we wouldn't, would we? That, that would be unkind, that would be cruel. And even on a Sunday or a Sabbath day, um, you would not dream of leaving an animal cooped up without any supplies or without any food or water. And the religious leaders knew that. That actually made a rule um, that said that you were allowed um, to go to your animal, untie them and lead him out to get food. You weren't allowed to carry anything on a, a Sabbath, but... You're allowed to lead your animal out to get food, provided they weren't carrying anything. You could also take them to the well. And you could actually draw up water out of the well and pour the bucket out or put the bucket down on the ground so that the animal could drink from it. You weren't allowed to hold the bucket while they had a drink, but you could put it on the ground so that they could have a drink. See, it was okay to look after your donkey on the Sabbath, but you couldn't look after people. So it seemed, anyway. And Jesus points out the hypocrisy here. You'll take care of your donkey, he says. Then should you not also, or sh then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath? From what bound her? It's a good question, isn't it? See, the things we do to serve others are important. Healing this woman may not have seemed like a big thing, okay, in the scheme of things. I mean, not in the scheme of the world and the politics of the day or anything like that, but it, but it was important to this lady. It was important to God. He was interested in it. He was pleased by it. And in this response, Jesus is saying to his critics and setting forth a, a precedent for us. He shows us clearly that the ministry that pleases God is ministry that brings healing. It's, it's ministry that brings release um, for those who are bound up, who are in bondage to Satan. And that's kingdom work. That's the work that pleases God. That's the work that honors God. Um, and what better day to do it on than God's holy day? See, the healing that we're called to bring is physical healing. Healing of diseases. It may be meeting people's physical needs, um, helping them in the garden, maybe providing temporary accommodation for them, meeting some transport need or, or, or the like. It, it may be that we're called to bring some emotional healing to people, to help heal some hurts, to, to spend time listening to them, to, have a, to give them a shoulder to cry on. It may be even relational healing that we're called to, to help with on a Sabbath, um, bringing peace into a troubled relationship, trying to act as a mediator, um, as an intercessor. It could even be spiritual healing, um, telling them about the one who can forgive them, opposing Satan's work, praying into the work of God. Um, these are restorative works. These are good works that God is calling us to do. 
Jesus knew better than those who were being critical in this regard. He knew um, what they were saying wasn't true. God was pleased with what he was doing, even though it didn't seem important in the bigger picture. And so he took the opportunity to teach them about God's truth. In verse 18, he goes on and he says this. He says, Then Jesus asked, What is the kingdom of God like? What shall I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden and it grew and it became a tree and the birds of the air perched in its branches. Now, I've got some mustard seeds here if I can get them out. I'll try not to spill them. I've got some mustard seeds here and, and they're, they're really small. I don't know, you probably can't even see them dropping here. Um, I'd pass it around a bit but someone's going to drop it and we'll have to clean it up. Um, but they're, they're really small. Um, I wonder what a mustard seed is good for. See, in Jesus' day, the mustard seed was the smallest seed that farmers used in their gardens, or one of the smallest seeds. Mustard seeds were, were considered the, probably the smallest um, item that you could measure. They, they were considered the smallest item that you could sort of weigh out um, using a balance or something like that. It was, called, it was considered so minute that it was used to describe things like the smallest drop of blood or the, 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 the last remnant of the sun glow in the sky um, as it set. But Jesus said that even from this small seed here, which, which you can't see from where you are, something big can grow. Black mustard seeds are, are the type of mustard that was growing around um, Galilee, where Jesus was ministering at this time. Do you want to see what a black mustard bush looks like? Yeah? No? I'll show you anyway. Um, here it is. Wow, I, I hear you gasp. Um, it's a massive tree, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. Could, could birds nest in, this bran in these branches here? Maybe little ones. Um, not too bigger ones. Um, it's not quite a tree, is it? What was Jesus getting at here? Jesus was using a, a literary technique that we call the, the hyperbole. He's saying, you know what? The things that people do for God are like mustard seeds. They're small. And often they don't seem like very much at all. Things like cleaning or, or helping putting the chairs out on a Sunday or wiping down the chairs between services or, or being kind to our neighbours who are sick or things like that, um, things that are small. Um, but from these little things, things grow and they 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 keep growing and they, they grow to become far more than what you would ever expect them to be. Even bigger than normal mustard seed bushes. They become trees so big that birds can nest in their branches and other things can, can rest in the shade underneath. And They're not just normal sized mustard trees. They become big trees. Let's think about some of the small things that we do for God that don't seem very important. How can someone coming in on a Saturday and cleaning our church be valuable or significant? When you get into your new, new building, my, my suspicions are COVID-19 is still going to be around. How will people going through and cleaning the chairs between services, wiping down services, be important? How can offering to put your neighbor's bin out because they're sick and elderly be valuable? How can going up to talk to someone who, who is looking a little bit outer in, in the social scene be valuable? See, what Jesus is saying here is that we'll never know what God can do with the little things that we do for him. They might not seem important to us, but when God takes them and when he uses them, they become significant. They become like a tree with lots of birds roosting in them, making nests in it. See, when we're Christians, everything we do is capable of being classed as kingdom work. 
It's valuable work in God's eyes when we do it in Jesus' name. This woman who Jesus healed was a nobody. We don't even know her name. We don't even know what city or what town Jesus was in. It just says he was in a synagogue. Where? In fact, we're not, we're not told anything about her, and she's not mentioned again in Scripture. We don't know that she ever did anything significant in her life at all from that point on or that time before. Um, she lived 18 years with this illness, and she probably could have lived another 18, 30, 50 years. It didn't need to be healed. But Jesus, in his grace and his sympathy, took pity on her, and the healing was miraculous. Was it important? Well, it was important to her. And her reaction was to praise God. That's a good thing. That's what our ministry should be all about, to bring glory to God, shouldn't it? It may have been small and insignificant in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, I don't think it was. And the implication is that although God's kingdom work starts small, as small as these mustard seeds, it can grow into something large, and it can do so at a rapid rate. See, success in God's um, hand is not limited by the initial size, but on whether it's done for God. Small things done for God can have a massive impact for his kingdom and can help grow his kingdom in phenomenal ways. They may be small, they may be insignificant, but in God's hands they're not. So the challenge for us is to offer our little things, our little bits of time, our little words for God to see what he can do with them. There's one more thing that Jesus had to say to those gathered here, and it was about yeast. Do you know what yeast is? Some of you who are, are cooks or, or love um, bread do. It's, it's stuff you put in bread, isn't it? In dough. Um, I've got it here. And, and kids, if you've never seen yeast, you can come down and have a bit of a look at it later. It's sort of like um, beige salt. It's about that, the size of salt. It's, oh, I don't know how else to describe it, if anyone's got a better description. But you, you, you put it in your dough and you mix it around and... and your dough rises, goes from, you know, the flat breads that you sometimes see to, to the loaves of bread that we eat with sandwiches and things like that. And this is what Jesus says about dough in verse 20, and he, or yeast. And he says, again, he asked, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like yeast that a, a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. See, Jesus said, when we add just a little bit of this yeast stuff into our dough... It spreads, and it spreads through the whole batch of dough, and it all rises. It's quite incredible if you've ever cooked bread and watched it um, do this. And what Jesus was saying here was that, you know, a little bit of something, a little bit of something that's done for God can have a wide impact. It can have a wide impact on your friends, on your workplace, on your neighborhood, your school, even potentially the whole world. See, when Jesus is introduced into a person's life, into a family, into a community or the world, he will spread. His impact will touch other parts of that person or that family or that community. Yeast's influence is contagious. And so should our acts of service be. Those who see them will either give praise to God or they'll be drawn towards God. And our actions, even though they're small, like Yeast or like mustard seed, even though they're, they're insignificant and undervalued by other people, if they're done for God and placed in His hands, He, by His Holy Spirit, can actually use them to, to, to minister to other people, to communities, to schools, to, to workplaces, to wherever you are at. It's amazing. Some of you sitting here today need to hear that God values what you do for His kingdom. You might look down on what you've got to offer, your gifts, your abilities. Others might look down on what you've got to offer and not trust you or not give you opportunities. But God doesn't because he's actually giving you those gifts and abilities and he wants you to use them for him. He took a shepherd boy, didn't he, with five stones and defeated a giant. He took another little boy with five um, loaves and, and a couple of fish and fed a multitude. He took Peter, this headstrong yet cowardly fisherman who disowned Jesus three times and he made him the leader of the early church. 
If God can do that with others who are willing, can't he do that with you? See, God doesn't care about the size of the offering that you've made or what you've got at your disposal, but he he cares whether you are seeking um, to make a difference in other people's lives. So my challenge to you, my encouragement is to look for opportunities to heal people in Jesus' name, to heal them physically, to heal them emotionally, to heal them relationally, to heal them spiritually, and have faith that God will actually use your efforts to glorify him. Remember William Carey, the little guy we spoke about earlier? Well, William Carey didn't let his detractors crush his spirits or his dreams of going to preach overseas. In fact, his zeal became greater and greater. And um, in 1772, he wrote an article that actually sparked the start of the modern Christian mission movement. Um, Millions and millions millions of missionaries are on the field today working throughout the world as a result of what William Carey started. William Carey's preaching must have um, improved because he was preaching that same year. I mean, he preached this sermon which is still impacting people around our globe today. Over 200 years later, his catch cry in that sermon was, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. He finally gained the support of the once resistant Baptist Association to establish a Baptist missionary society. And before long, they selected Carey to go to India to spearhead its mission. That was in 1793, and it took seven years before William Carey saw any converts at all. Seven hard years with no fruit. But in the next 20 years, he baptized over 1,400 people. 20 years, do the maths there. 14 times 5 is 70 people a year. How would you like to baptize 70 people a year? You, through your ministry and your evangelism. That's the impact Carey was having. But, but there was more than that. See, William Carey didn't ever go to any formal universities or anything like that. He, he wasn't really that well educated, but he was gifted with languages. And after working for seven and a half years, he translated the New Testament into Bengali, the language that he was working in. Um, again, it took him an, another 10 years or so, and he had most or a, a fair amount of the Old Testament finished. By 1837, he and his helpers had actually translated portions of Scripture into 40 different languages so that people that were coming to know Jesus Christ could be discipled. But there was more than that too because he opened up schools to help the Indians actually learn to read so that they could read their scriptures, so that they could grow in their faith about God. Um, He opened up 102 schools. It had over 7,000 students in these schools. Some of those schools are still operating over 200 years later. This was the impact. William Carey was a little simple cobbler, with limited education, not a great ability in preaching. He had nothing grand or mighty to offer to God. He was just as insignificant as that mustard seed or that little bit of yeast. But when he gave himself to God and God started to use him, his ministry caused the kingdom of God to grow into this huge tree. And there there are sections of India that are just powerhouse Christian movements as a result of what William Carey did. Millions of Christians have come to know Jesus Christ because of his influence. His influence spread like yeast. I don't know whether we've got anyone sitting here today, any, any William Careys sitting in the auditorium, or any William Careys listening at home. I know that we've got the same God at work in us who was at work in William Carey. Carey didn't have much to offer, but he was willing um, to think big and step out in faith. He expected great things and he attempted great things and God blessed that willingness. I wonder this morning, are you willing to release your mustard seeds to God? Are you willing to sow your yeast into 
the place in which you are found day in and day out? Whatever you do, whether it be big or small, do it in the name of Jesus and allow God to do something great with it. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, um, we are reminded today that you chose the lowly things to frustrate the wise. You, you take the weak things, Lord, to show up the strong. Today, Lord, we, we don't have much at our disposal. We know that. Um, but what we have, Lord, we want to give to you. We want to put in your hands our mustard seed. A little bit of yeast. We want to give it to you to use as you see fit. We don't want to control things at all. You know far better than us how it will be used to bring you glory and honor. But we want to be obedient today. We want to cast ourselves and what we have and give it to you. So take it, Lord, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Um, faith is really that. Faith is hearing from God. It's receiving what he says into our lives as true and authoritative. These are the very words of Jesus. And then it's realigning our lives to put those things into practice. That's faith. And uh, we want to respond with faith now um, as people. Faith is like receiving a seed of God's word planted in good soil. And as we let that grow, what it can produce is amazing. So let's stand up and let's worship this morning because we're going to sing this song, Oceans. And, and, I've, and if I know the Holy Spirit, I reckon he's put on our hearts and minds things this very day that he's saying, hey, I'm calling you to, to offer this to me. And we can just do that even in this song now. We can step out on the waters, not because of who we are, but because of who God is and let him work in us. So let's respond as we worship this morning.
sure there's a response in people's hearts this morning as we sense that, Lord, just God wanting to step out in, in new places, Lord, and to offer what we have into your hands, Lord, the one who created the world, who created us, and loves to use people like us who just offer that to you, God, and just do something fresh and new in and through our lives, we pray. And thank you for this church, Lord. We are like a, a mustard seed. We are like a little bit of yeast you've planted in the communities of Fernie Grove and up at Ketchin, Lord. And we look forward to seeing how your kingdom is going to grow, how it is going to spread, Lord. We take hold of this word what we are now and what you are going to do in the future, Lord. It is right for us to receive this today and put our trust fully on you. And may we see a great movement and spread, Lord, for your sake, Jesus, for your glory and for the salvation of many, many lives, we pray, God. That is what it is all about. Use us, Lord. We offer our lives to the church afresh to you this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. All the people said. Amen. Amen. I love how how Dave gave some practical examples here this morning. We're going to have some practical ways you can serve. I should have had some sign-up sheets already.